Bonjour and guten Tag, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lars Schall and I welcome you to a discussion dedicated to the Council on Foreign Relations, or in short, just CFR. What is the CFR, you may ask? Well, Joseph Kraft wrote in an article entitled School of Statesmen, which was published in Harper's Magazine in July 1958, that the CFR is a school for statesmen that comes close to being an organ of, why, of what C. Wright Mills has called the power elite, a group of men similar in interest and outlook, shaping events from invulnerable positions behind the scenes. If this sounds interesting to you, then continue to listen to this program, because my guest today is a real expert when it comes to the CFR. Who is it? It's the U.S. historian Lauren Shoup, who lives in the San Francisco Bay Area. In 1977, Lawrence co-authored with William Minter the groundbreaking book Imperial Brain Trust, the Council on Foreign Relations and the United States Foreign Policy. In 2015, Lawrence returned to the research subject called CFR when he published Wall Street's Think Tank, the Council on Foreign Relations and the Empire of Neoliberal Geopolitics 1976 to 2014. And so I say now, hi Lawrence, thank you for being with us. It's nice to be here, Lars. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, for me, it's a real honor to talk to you because your book, Imperial Brain Trust, was quite influential for me. And now your new book, uh, well, it's just brilliant. And um, I want to say this, but uh, tell us when and why did you become interested in the CFR? Well, in the 1960s, I was an anti-war activist. Uh, we were struggling against the Vietnam War, which we felt was an imperialist war. And so I became interested as a uh, historian in how the origins of that war got going. Uh, and I began to read power structure uh, books like C. Wright Mills' The Power Elite. Also, G. William Domhoff's book, Who Rules America?, where he mentions the Council on Foreign Relations as a behind-the-scenes organization that has a lot of power, but is not well known. So I became interested in the Council on Foreign Relations as part of an activist who wanted to change U.S. foreign policy, so we needed to understand where it came from. Well, it comes from the capitalist class, uh, and the Council on Foreign Relations is a main organ, uh, behind-the-scenes organization, semi-secret even, uh, although it's, you can find information out about it, of course. They have an annual report. They have a website, CFR.org. So you can't find information out about it, but they don't advertise themselves. Rather, they work through the individuals that are members of this organization. Yeah. And uh, w now when we would take a look at the origins of the CFR, I think we need to talk first about a group of people outside the United States, and that would be the Rhodes-Milner Group in Great Britain. Do you agree? Uh, yes, that's true. But also there was a, a domestic origin of the CFR. There's really two origins of the CFR. The one you're referring to, which I'll get to, but let me start with the CFR in 1918, because there was an organization that was founded, it was a businessman's organization that was founded during the First World War by New York businessmen who wanted to expand their international trade contacts and, and make more international contacts for business reasons. These were New York capitalists, and the leader of them was Elaha Root, who was an in and out, which I use this term in and out, which means uh, someone that is in the government and then goes back to private business. Well, Root was a lawyer that served the capitalists of the time, Andrew Carnegie and the Harrimans and people like that, J.P. Morgan. He was advisor to the big Morgan banking firms. And so he was a private individual that went into the government, McKinley administration as secretary of war, and then the, Ro the Theodore Roosevelt administration as secretary of state. And he was the one who planned a lot of U.S. imperial policies of the time colonial policies in Philippines and Cuba, and expanding U.S. interests. So he was the leader of this Council on Foreign Relations that was founded in New York, but it was a small organization. There were only about 100 people or something like that in it. But First World War was going on, and that's where this foreign group becomes more important, the Rhodes-Milner Group. And that has to do with the, it goes back really to the inquiry, because we need to talk about the inquiry, which I, I know you're going to ask me, but why don't I just talk about it in respect to the founding of the Council on Foreign Relations, because it really relates to that. And that was a group of policy planning uh, for post-war policy for after World War I that President Wilson set up 
and his his advisor, Colonel House, hired the young Walter Lippmann, a very famous uh, intellectual in the United States, a journalist in the United States, to be the head of the inquiry, which brought in intellectuals to plan a, the 14 points, really, and the post-World War I world order. So those same individuals who were part of the planning process that President Wilson set up during the First World War went to the Paris Peace Conference as advisors to the American delegation to the Paris Peace Conference. And there they met the British delegation, which was dominated by this Rhodes-Milner group. And, of course, Cecil Rhodes was the super imperialist colonialist, most famous for his uh, holdings in southern Africa, his mines, his gold mines, his diamond mines in southern Africa, and became super wealthy and was a very uh, expansive imperialist. He wanted to control the whole world, of course, and he realized that it was difficult to control the whole world without having the U.S. as an ally, as well as the Australians and New Zealand, South Africa, uh, Canada, other you know connections around the world to have a world order that was dominated by English-speaking people. So he had a, a Lord Milner. These were nobles of the British, British nobles. He had Lord Milner set up something called the Round Table Group, which had corresponding organizations in all these countries that I mentioned, the United States, Canada, Australia, South Africa, New Zealand. And their orientation was to set up a British control worldwide and with the allies, with the United States, allied with that. So they met, that. getting back to the Paris Peace Conference, the inquiry group of scholars met with the Rhodes-Milner Brit connected British delegation, and they decided to set up a, a, an organization which would have two branches, one in Britain and one in the United States, and it would be called the British Institute for International Affairs and the American Institute for International Affairs. And... So that, that became set up, and in Britain it became what's called Chatham House, which is still a very important policy planning uh, think tank type organization in Britain. And the United States American Institute kind of floundered until they started to meet up with this previous organization that I talked about, the Council on Foreign Relations, the businessman's organization that wanted to expand global trade and investment and increase profits for American businessmen, especially Wall Street. Uh, so they met up with those people, and they joined and formed a new organization, which they called the Council on Foreign Relations. They dropped the American Institute for International Affairs title. And so these were intellectuals that were associated with the inquiry group that connected up with the businessmen who wanted international expansion, and they formed the Council on Foreign Relations in 1921, and they started in 1922 Foreign Affairs Magazine in order to try to expand uh, their ideas or, or promulgate their ideas in a wide form. So the Council on Foreign Relations is a mix of intellectuals, professionals that are connected in and dominated by, in my view, the capitalist class, especially Wall Street. And this guy, this inner outer guy that was, you know, advisor to all these important people, including presidents, he became the honorary chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations that was the, the merged organization in 1921. And he remained the honorary president of the Council on Foreign Relations until 1938 when he passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, you've mentioned the Inquiry Group um, and Walter Lippmann. And Walter Lippmann wrote a very famous and influential book and really important book, uh, Public Opinion. And uh, is in this book something that we should take notice of when it comes to the modus operandi of the Council on Foreign Relations? Yes, of course, because they, their, their ideas are to spread their policy planning ideas, and they have kind of a, uh, their, their goals are, they say in their annual reports, again, people who are interested in this topic could go on this, the website cfr.org.org, and get copy of the the copy of their annual report. But anyway, they say in their annual report that their their orientation or their their surface gold goals for public consumption are to help understand U.S. foreign policy choices for leaders and publics. But their deeper goal, of course, in conjunction with Britain at first, is to run the world, to to control the world. First with Britain to uh, in alliance with the British Empire. That is the 1920s and 30s and then later succeeding Britain to become the dominant world power, which has taken place, 
And now they have a neoliberal geopolitical worldview, which I can talk about, which I mentioned as the subtitle of the book. That's their worldview, combining neoliberalism, free market capitalism, private private investment, and so on, and the geopolitical uh, control of uh, that results from military power. So they have a uh, surface goal kind of that they put out, and then they have the deeper goal, which is world control. And uh, that I express that in the... Uh, in, in a number of the chapters of the book, of my book, Wall Street's Think Tank, trying to explain in detail how that has operated historically and in the contemporary period. Yeah. And um, now, if we um, talk about conquering the world, you can conquer the world by conquering um, public opinion? Well, no. They need, they need hard power, that is military power, and they need soft power, but public opinion... Uh, is very important for their so soft power ideas. That is, that convinces people if you have soft power, not just hard power. Hard power is exemplified by military force. And, of course, the U.S. has the strongest military and spends more on military spending than the next six or eight countries combined, uh, vastly more, although China is gaining on that in that realm. But they also want to use soft power. That is attraction, seduction, admiration, moral authority, co-optation, legitimacy, ideally leading to voluntary agreement. So for public opinion, both domestically and internationally, they want to have this uh, cooperation soft power in order to get dialogue, cooperation. Uh, the Marshall Plan after World War II would be an example of using soft power to mm -hmm. rebuild mm -hmm. Europe. Uh, so they're trying to convince. They're not just conquering. This has a longer-lasting effect. And, of course, the soft power, uh, intellectual for soft power, was Joseph Nye, or is Joseph Nye Jr., a Harvard professor of political science. He developed this concept in his books Bound to Lead uh, in 1990, and The Soft Power was the name of his book in 2004. He's been a CFR member for th over 35 years, and he was a CFR director for 10 years. He's not currently a CFR director. He went off the board, CFR board, in 2013. But he is the guru of soft power, and he's a CFR person. Uh, so Walter Lippmann's ideas have been followed up and developed more by this Joseph Nye Jr. Harvard professor. And, of course, that gets into the intellectuals that are most closely connected to the Council on Foreign Relations, and those are Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, Johns Hopkins, University of Chicago, and Stanford. Those are the universities in the United States that are most connected with the Council on Foreign Relations. The Council on Foreign Relations, of course, is a U.S. organization. Its membership is only available or only open to U.S. Uh, nationals, although its corporate membership, and I should mention that the Council on Foreign Relations has a very large membership. It's almost 5,000 individuals, U.S. citizens. Now, some of them, of course, were born somewhere else. Rupert Murdoch, for example, was born in Australia. He moved to the United States, became a U.S. citizen, and was able to get into the Council on Foreign Relations. You, you get in if the board of directors approves you. Uh, and, of course, Murdoch has a tremendous media power, and they're on the right uh, side of the spectrum, so they wanted to get him in. So there's people that were born in other countries but become U.S. citizens are now in the Net Council on Foreign Relations, a number of them, actually. But, the, but in terms of the corporate membership, they have about 175 corporate members And it's all the big corporations you could name, the multinational corporations, especially the big finance capital uh, Wall Street firms, but also a lot of oil companies, a lot of uh, the uh, uh, military industrial complex companies, a whole lot of companies are in there. But th those foreign companies can be in there. So, 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 for example, Deutsche Bank is a corporate member of the Council on Foreign Relations. If you're a German citizen, you can't be a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. But Deutsche Bank, a corporate a uh, corporation can be a corporate member of the Council on Foreign Relations. So that's uh, how they work it as far as... And I have a whole chapter, of course, on the international connections of the Council on Foreign Relations where are very extensive. The Bilderberger Group, the Trilateral Commission, the, the work at Davos, uh, the, the International Crisis Group. They have a whole number of uh, organizations that connect the Council. And the Council has an international advisory board, which includes, uh, of course, some German members as well. And they have that meets with the council directors every year to give them advice on international affairs. And it's a very broad a number of, uh, you know, powerful nations are involved in the international advisor group to the Council on Foreign Relations. 
Of course, this sounds as um, if the council is quite powerful and influential. And to make it more uh, tangible for our listeners, from autumn 1939 onwards, the CFR demonstrated its influence with the so-called war and peace studies. And why is this important? And could you please tell our listeners was what happened in Washington, D.C. at the State Department on September 12, 1939? Well, September 12, of course, the war started, uh, World War II started on September 1st, 1939. Twelve days later, leaders of the Council on Foreign Relations were meeting with the Assistant Secretary of State at the State Department in Washington, D.C., proposing that the Council on Foreign Relations organize and plan uh, for the post-World War II order. Now, the war had just started. The United States wasn't even going to get in the war for another couple of years, although no one knew when the United States would get in the war. But still, it was a pretty long shot to see the United States even getting in the war at that time. There was a big anti-war movement in the United States called America First. And yet the Council on Foreign Relations was meeting with the Assistant Secretary of State saying, let's plan for the post-war world. Well, this, this shows the vast ambition, the tremendous ambition and the reach of the Council on Foreign Relations, because, of course, the State Department leader said, yes, of course, that sounds like a good idea. The Council went to its connections in the financial community and got the Rockefeller Foundation to pledge a, a large amount of money for the time, $50,000, to start a, these planning groups, and they were called the War Peace Studies. And the planning groups uh, started right away in 1940, and they began to plan first for a U.S. policy in the Far East, which led to the Japanese attack because they proposed that they would restrict, uh, you know, the U.S. exports to Japan, and they also proposed something called the Grand Area. Now, the Grand Area was basically the entire world except for Western Europe, which at that time was controlled by uh, Nazi Germany. So they said we, we should have this grand area because the U.S. economy depends upon exports and imports to and from these, this, the entire world, the British Empire, the Far East, and Western Hemisphere. The yeah, grand and, it's, e and it's dependent on raw materials. Yeah, raw materials. The exports and imports, the imports would be a lot of raw materials. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of raw materials, but also some uh, industrial goods even from some certain countries, but agricultural and raw materials from a lot of places. So they had this grand area plan as part of the war peace studies. And then, of course, once the United States got into the war, these same planners that were part of this Council on Foreign Relations planning study groups, that's how the council works. They have study groups that, plan, that study a particular issue. Let's say, for example, now China, they'll have 40 people get together and talk about, you know, that have some interest or knowledge about it. Businessmen who have interest, intellectuals have a lot of knowledge, military people have some uh, knowledge about Chinese military, they'll get together and talk about future China policy. Well, in this case, they were talking about what to do after World War II, uh, how to control the world. And the State Department set up their own planning group, but they were told by the higher-ups, or because a lot of the State Department people were council people, to integrate the council's effort for, here's a private organization, the Council on Foreign Relations is completely private, it doesn't take any uh, uh, governmental money, uh, it's, it says it's nonpartisan. It doesn't uh, favor the Republicans or the Democrats, although sometimes it does, of course, and we'll get to that in another question maybe later on. Uh, but anyway, they, uh, they work to plan this policy long range, and they told the State Department, we need to have our planners in there because we've already got a lot of a leg up on everything. So they brought in, the State Department brought in the Council on Foreign Relations planners to plan the post-war order. And, of course, they they believed that they needed to have a political arm of that post-war order, and that became the United Nations. And they needed to have an economic arm of that post-war order, and that became the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank. And these were institutions that were developed in a process with negotiation with the British and other allied powers during World War II, uh, but the United States uh, had, had this plan, and it came from the Council on Foreign Relations in order to integrate the post-war world order dominated by the United States. Yeah. yeah. And now talking about the grand area, was this later on um, important, for example, related to the policy of the U.S. towards Southeast China, uh, Asia? 
Yes, yes. They they specifically mentioned in this war peace studies, which are quite extensive, they had over 600 and some odd memos, memorandums that they sent to the State Department and to President Roosevelt and the other people in the administration, Secretary of State Cordell Hall and others. They sent these memorandums. There was 600 and some memorandums and they had multiple copies of each one. And that's one reason I got interested in writing my PhD dissertation on the Council on Foreign Relations. I'd heard about it, as I mentioned, through Domhoff's book, which came out in the late 60s. But in the early 70s, I was looking for a PhD topic, and I was looking in the library, and I was, this I like to use to go up and down the aisle and look at the different books. And, and so I was looking at a foreign policy section of the library, and I saw something said the War Peace Studies and there were all these volumes, massive number of volumes. Well, it was these 600 and some memos that the Council on Foreign Relations had sent out to, to the, the government during the war. And after the war, they, they were so proud of all the work that they made 50 copies and sent them to different libraries. Well, Northwestern, where I was going to school, had a, lot, had a copy. So I looked at these and they, I saw the Grand Area and all these other things. And it was totally fascinating. Geopolitics writ large. And I thought this would be an excellent dissertation topic. So I had a little trouble getting some of my professors to go along, but <laughs> I eventually did and wrote my PhD dissertation on the war peace studies. Uh, so uh, they they it was very extensive, and they had a lot of uh, they they even decided that there would be an unconditional surrender imposed on uh, Germany and Japan. That was part of it too. Uh, they had a, just a vast amount of studies that were done by leading intellectuals, Harvard, uh, Princeton, Yale, etc. Intellectuals and others who had military experience. That's the other thing about the Council on Foreign Relations. It isn't just civilians. They have all kinds of admirals. They have 60-some-odd admirals and generals who yeah. are members of the Council on Foreign Relations. So, so the military-industrial complex is represented in the CFR? Yeah, not, not as high as representation as the financial capitalist, what I could call the financial capitalist complex, Wall Street. If you look at the top group of corporate members of the Council on Foreign Relations, you see all the big uh, finance capital corporations from Wall Street, Citibank, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, etc. And you also see a lot of oil companies, Chevron and Shell and Hess and ExxonMobil. But, and they're not, they're not in the top group of corporate members. They rank the corporate members as per donations. And that's the, the top group includes these oil and financial corporations especially. But the other corporate members of the part of the 175 include Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Dynan Corporation, General Electric, Northrop Grumman, Rayathon, United Technologies, Floor, Booz Allen Hamilton. These are all a part of the military industrial complex and they're corporate members. And if you look at the board of directors, the leaders of these corporations, they're also in most cases members of the Council on Foreign Relations. For example, the owner, the main owner of General Dynamic, who's the General D Dynamics, who's the uh, uh, main uh, stockholder, the leading stockholder of it, is Lester Crown, and he's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. The Lockheed Martin, the uh, Robert J. Stevens, who was CEO from 2004 to 2012 of Lockheed Martin, is a Council on Foreign Relations member. Boeing has a lot of Council on Foreign Relations members on their board of directors, etc. So there's multiple interlocks. They're not just... Uh, the military industrial complex corporations aren't just corporate members of the council. They're also their leading people, CEOs and chairmen and many board members are also members of the council. So there's multiple points of interconnection there. And then a lot of these military people, uh, one of them on the council right now is General Abizad, who was uh, the head of the uh, Iraq war. He was chair. He was the general that was in charge of the Iraq war for a while. He's now a, on the board of directors of the Council of Foreign Relations, and he's being invited to join some of these military industrial complex organizations. I forget which one he's a uh, director of, but he's been invited to join some of them. So there's multiple contacts between the military industrial complex and the council, but the financial capitalists are the ones that control the council. I looked at in my book, I talk about the 10 uh, top leaders of the Council on Foreign Relations. There are people like David Rockefeller, who was also chairman of the council not just chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations, but chairman of the, of the Chase Manhattan Bank. And Peter Peterson, who was the chairman of the council, but also chairman of Blackstone, a leading private equity firm. Currently, we have Robert Rubin, who is co-chair. He, he made his career in Goldman Sachs and Citibank. 
So eight out of the 10 of top leaders of the Council on Foreign Relations since 1976 are connected to Wall Street and finance capital, and many of the vice chairmen as well, people like Douglas Dillon, you know, or Cyrus Vance, who's a Wall Street lawyer. Uh, these are vice chairmen uh, of, of the council. They've been vice chairmen. And so they both passed away, actually, but we're talking the period 1996 to the present. They were vice chairman of the council for a while. Yeah. And yeah. Maurice Greenberg of uh, the uh, American uh, International, International uh, Insurance uh, he he was a, a vice chairman of the council. So Wall Street is dominant, and the capitalist class is dominant in the Council on Foreign Relations. But the military-industrial complex, along with the uh, intellectuals from these universities that I mentioned, are also key at the Council on Foreign Relations because they uh, they represent the geopolitical or the intellectual side that the council wants to you know have connected. So the Wall Street dominates, but these other people play an important subsidiary role cooperative role yeah yeah we will come back to this but um now with regards to the vietnam war so ideas from the um one peace studies or the grand area strategy yeah. popped up then again 20 years later yeah. that's right the uh, I, i guess i lost my train of thought there a little bit because the 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 southeast asia was seen in this grand area study as an area that was very complementary to the u.s economy And that's what they were considering. That is, it had raw materials like tin and rubber and tungsten that the United States needed, and they didn't have the industry that the United States could supply. So it was a complementary trade area. And that was one thing that they were looking at in the grand area, complementary trade areas so the United States could export. And we have to remember that these capitalists are always interested in finding export markets and raw material sources and increasingly now cheap labor supplies. Of course, that gets into a whole question of what's happened to the American working class when they, the jobs get exported to China and other low-wage areas. But that's part of their uh, accumulation model for capital accumulation is now to get cheap areas for labor. And so Southeast Asia is, is a cheap area for labor. They can, they, can, uh, send, they can have textiles produced there and sent to the United States at a very cheap rate. Uh, also Bangladesh, other places like that. So... They, they're interested in cheap labor, and they're interested in this complementary, how it complements the U.S. economy. So they don't have to change their economy at home because they can export and import what they need abroad. So foreign policy is always connected for these capitalists with not having to change anything seriously at home, which might undermine their power. And so they need these, these foreign markets. So that led to the Vietnam War, of course, and then Imperial Brain Trust, Uh, Mentor and I and I actually wrote the part on, on the Vietnam War. Right? We called it Vietnam War, but we really should call it the U.S. War on Vietnam because that's what it was. Uh, it was U.S. aggression in Vietnam, and there's been books, many books illustrating that. But they had study groups at the Council on Foreign Relations in the late 40s and early 50s, which you know pinpointed how important uh, Southeast Asia was for the United States, and therefore they had to prevent the the uh, expansion of the left in Southeast Asia that is represented by the North Vietnamese and maintain a client regime, a neo-colony in South Vietnam. And so that was what the Vietnam War was all about. North Vietnam wanting to unite the country as per the 1954 Geneva Accords, uh, which said that they should have an election to unite the country. And of course, the South Vietnamese, uh, sponsored by the, by the United States, didn't want to have the election because Ho Chi Minh would win the elections, the leader of uh, North Vietnam. So they didn't want to have that election. So they undermined that. And so then when North Vietnam tried to, uh, well, South Vietnamese themselves began to rebel against this neo-colonial regime. They didn't like it because it was not serving the people, serving the imperialists instead. So they began to fight against that and North Vietnam helped them. Then the United States came in and that's the, that's the Vietnam War. But the origins of it, as I expressed in uh, Imperial Brain Trust in a chapter there, went back to the, the war peace studies and then the early late 40s and early 50s study groups at the council where they brought these different people together to make recommendations for policy. And these recommendations are almost always sent off to the government. And, of course, the governmental people are connected to the Council on Foreign Relations. You know, the, the current Obama administration, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Treasury, the National Security Advisor, the Secretary of Commerce, the Secretary of Energy, the Secretary of Health, 
Education and Welfare. Those are all Council on Foreign Relations members. In many cases, we're Council on Foreign Relations directors. Uh, so all those people uh, are close to the council. John Kerry, for example, the Secretary of State, has been a council member for many, many years. He got his daughter into the council. He got his wife into the council. He got his brother into the council, or they got themselves into the council. I'm not sure exactly how it worked, but his, his family, a whole bunch of his family members are in the Council on Foreign Relations. Similarly with the Clintons. Uh, Bill Clinton's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations from the 1980s. Chelsea Clinton became a member in 2012. Hillary Clinton's never become a member, but she's spoken at the Council on Foreign Relations at least 10 times in recent years and has made some statements that indicate that she follows the Council on Foreign Relations very carefully. For example, in 2009, she went to the Council on Foreign Relations when they set up their new headquarters, they have they've, their regular headquarters are always has been in New York, but they had a secondary headquarters that they set up in Washington, D.C. with a new building and so on. In 2009, Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, and she said, quote, it's good to have an outpost of the council right here down the street from the State Department. We get a lot of advice from the council. So this will mean I won't have as far to go to be told what we should be doing and how we should think about the future end quote from Hillary Clinton when she was Secretary of State. So even though she's not a member, her, her husband is and her daughter is, and she's spoken there many times and she highly regards the council. Her leading advisors are members of the Council on Foreign Relations, even directors like Alan Binder uh, is a director of the council. She's one of his, uh, he's one of her um, main economic advisors. Paul Volcker, a former member, a former director of the council and a current member, he's one of his advisors, a number of her advisors, a number of other advisors or Hillary Clinton are members of the CFR. So she's very close to the CFR and her administration would draw on CFR uh, members and leaders uh, very highly, in my opinion, if she's elected. Yeah. You've talked about powerful and influential members of the CFR from the military industrial complex or the financial industry. And I think this is essential um, for the answer to the next question, and that is... What makes the CFR unique compared to other think tanks, such as the Brookings Institution or the American Enterprise Institute? Well, it's uh, the first thing you need to remember about the Council on Foreign Relations. It's a membership organization that has almost 5,000 members leading from intellectuals, from the media, from the nonprofits, from leading businesses. Uh, so they have a vast storage of knowledge and expertise in so many areas that they can draw on as part of for their study groups and for their membership activities. These other organizations don't have that membership, Brookings or Inter American Enterprise or anyone you want to name. Most organizations are even either a think tank or a membership organization and not both. The Council on Foreign Relations is both, and that's the only one that is. It also has a larger percent of top leaders Uh, from the government that go in and out of the government back and forth to the Council on Foreign Relations. You know, Bill Clinton would be an example. He was president. Then he goes in, he's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and participates in their activities. Uh, Jimmy Carter was a member of the, is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Similarly, George H.W. Bush is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, these are presidents. Uh, they, there's also a number of vice presidents that have been members of the Council on Foreign Relations, to say nothing of almost every secretary of state. So when they leave government, they're still members of the council. Even when they're in the government, they're still members of the council. Dick Cheney, who was so important in the George W. Bush administration, is a member of the CFR and was a director two different times. And he's still there, so he can go into the council and meet with them and make recommendations and so on. So they have a much higher level, top level leaders are in the council. And they link to a vast number of other institutions. For example, these other institutions that you mentioned, the Brookings Institution especially, is heavily interlocked with the Council on Foreign Relations. The president of the Brookings Institution is Strobe Talbot. He was a director of the Council on Foreign Relations, and he's still a member. Uh, so there's a, a more of a uh, direct to the Council on Foreign Relations from Brookings uh, that, you know, the council is more dominant. Richard Haas... Uh, was, a, was a fellow at the Brookings Institution, and he made a speech at the uh, CFR, and he said, we at the Brookings recognize that the CFR is the blue chip think tank, and we follow your lead. 
And he became later became president of the Council on Foreign Relations. This is when he was working for the Brookings. So even people at Brookings recognized that the council was the leader. Now, all not all uh, people who study think tanks uh, know that because one guy that was studying think tanks ranked Brookings first, Carnegie Endowment second, and the Council on Foreign Relations third among think tanks of the United States. And he cited as his proof that the Brookings had more fellows than the council. Well, the council has about 100 fellows and Brookings has about 300. But the council has almost 800 professors that are members of the council. <laughs> and they have 500 ex-government officials that are members of the council, including all these, you know, Secretary of Defense and, you know, Secretary of State and all these other people. So way more uh, firepower at the Council on Foreign Relations than at Brookings. And American Enterprise Institute, of course, that's similar. They they have, there's a right-wing organization, more conservative, and they, they're not a membership organization either. Uh, so the council is unique, and it has a much more firepower, much more connections uh, worldwide and domestically to powerful institutions than the other think tanks in the United States. And I think I've shown that in Wall Street's think tank. Uh, I've talked about all these, a lot of the other, not all of them, of course, but I talk about a dozen or so of the other think tanks showing how they're interlocked with the council and how the council is much more powerful. I call the Council on Foreign Relations the most powerful private organization in the United States, which means it's the most powerful private organization in world history. And that's my view of the Council on Foreign Relations. It's very worthwhile looking at it because that's how you understand what's going on. Uh, even things that I didn't put in my book, for example, U.S.-Cuba policy, I noticed that the Council on Foreign Relations was beginning to uh, decide that it should change, that the U.S. should change its Cuba policy because it wasn't working. Uh, now, it's kind of late. They should have been changing it decades ago, but, but they decided at this point they should change. And they recommended to Obama that he should change Cuba policy. And sure enough, Obama shortly thereafter changed his Cuba, pol Cuba policy and decided to recognize the Republic of Cuba. Yeah. Uh, now, could you give us an idea how the um, how the uh, uh, CFR is structured when it comes to the think tank work? And I think we should talk about the study program that was founded by David Rockefeller. Yeah, David Rockefeller, of course, he he didn't really found the study program. Uh, David Rockefeller is an interesting case because there's been no single individual that's been more identified with the Council on Foreign Relations than David Rockefeller. He became a member. Remember, he was born in, in, in uh, 1915, the grandson of John D. Rockefeller. He was born in 1915. He's still alive. At, uh, mm -hmm. This year, he's 101. And so in 1941, he became a member. In 1949, he became a director. In 1970, he became a chair, the chairman and stayed chairman until 1985. And then, in two, and then every year, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations in their annual report lists the top donors. Well, David Rockefeller appears in every year as one of the top donors. And in 2007, he don't, it, most of the time they don't say how much money is being given each time. But in 2007, the Council on Foreign Relations annual report did list a range. And it said above 25 million, one, you know, that year, David Rockefeller gave over 25 million. And they mentioned David Rockefeller. They didn't have anybody else giving over 25 million. Everyone else, they listed 10 to 25 and other people, et cetera. Anyway, so they renamed the study program the David Rockefeller Studies Program. The study program actually dates back into the 1920s when they be first began to develop this idea to bring together people to plan a policy and then have a publication or a memo or maybe both uh, that would then go to the governmental officials deciding that policy. Now, one of the first study groups was on ores and industries of the Far East by Foster Bain, uh, one of the council's fellows. Uh, and he, he wrote a book, Ores and Industries. So they're interested in tapping the ores and industry of the Far East, China, Southeast Asia, etc., in the 20s. And that book came out, and the other key forum where they put out study group reports of different kinds, and oftentimes they don't mention it comes from a study group, but if you look at the Council on Foreign Relations annual report and you look at the content of the, um, the report or the book or whatever, you can see that it's a study group report. And oftentimes in the preface to the book, it'll 
thank the people involved and you can find out, oh, this was a study group or even mention the study group. Anyway, Foreign Affairs Magazine publishes a lot of Council on Foreign Relations study group results. And they don't necessarily say uh, that it's, it's a study group result. They just say they have an author there, Harvard professor so-and-so writes on this topic and then it's published in Foreign Affairs, their magazine. That's why Foreign Affairs is so widely read worldwide. Because people in the know, in other countries, uh, the, the leadership particularly, they know that foreign affairs represents the Council on Foreign Relations worldview in Maine. They might have some other views expressed as a kind of a forum or a discussion, a uh, place, to, a venue for discussion. It isn't necessarily everything in there is Council on Foreign Relations recommended policies, but many of them are. Then you have to really know who the players are, who the members of the council are, and who's in the study groups to find out whether that's really a representative representing the council worldview or it's just a kind of a th an idea that they're putting out to, to maybe be discussed. So they have various ways that they put out this, disseminate the work for the study group and the study group might go on for a year or more. Uh, and they'll have these dozens of people that are meeting and discussing and reading and there'll be a, someone that'll be the, uh, one of the fellows at the council, a hired employee, an intellectual from someplace, uh, one of the un big universities probably, will be writing notes on what's discussed and then a book or a publication for foreign affairs or testimony uh, before the uh, House you know, Intelligence Committee or the House Foreign Affairs or the Senate Foreign Affairs or whatever uh, will be then disseminated by that person. And they have blogs. They have you know many ways. Oh, another thing is they go on the media and you'll be watching PBS and then you'll see somebody from the Council on Foreign Relations. Well, I'll know it's from the Council on Foreign Relations, but maybe somebody doesn't else doesn't know, but it says Harvard University. But he's been in a study group in the Council on Foreign Relations, and he's talking about the viral view of the Council on Foreign Relations. Or they'll mention Joe Blow from the Council on Foreign Relations is talking today on Egypt. You know, and then they'll interview that guy, and they won't tell you anything about what the Council on Foreign Relations is. Uh, but Judy Woodruff and uh, other people, Margaret Warner and others at the the PBS in the United States, the uh, Public Broadcasting System Television Network, they're members of the Council on Foreign Relations. So many of the media are members of the Council on Foreign Relations. The newspaper people, many of them are in the Council. And they don't say they're CFR oftentimes. Sometimes they mention it, but then they don't say what CFR is. But they mention these from the CFR or not. And if you, if you watch it closely, you know what's going on. It's a vast topic. I've tried to cover it in one book of 352 pages and 798 footnotes because, as you mentioned, Lars, uh, that it's very important to document these, these things because I'm making assertions. And some people will say, oh, isn't that a conspiracy? And no, I, I say it's not a conspiracy. It's a common purpose. The capitalist class has a common purpose, and they ally themselves with intellectuals who also want to advance. These intellectuals would like to get into the capitalist class if they're not already so they can get a corporate board, you know, position if they're cooperating with the Council on Foreign Relations and they're thinking like that and they're trained like that, so they are working with the Council on Foreign Relations. So, But the capitalist class are the ones that run the Council on Foreign Relations. They're in charge, and uh, that's what I document very heavily in my book. And it, as I say, it's a big topic. Uh, if someone's interested in writing a doctoral dissertation, if you read my book first, you may get some ideas about a specific topic. Yeah, and, from and, that uh, from that book. Yeah, and uh, to give an idea about the influence of the CFR, and talking now about intellectuals, um, we have already mentioned three wars: World War One, World War Two, and the Vietnam War. Now I want to talk with you, for example, about the war in Afghanistan and in the Near East. And uh, when we talk about intellectuals. Isn't it interesting, in foreign affairs, we have in the 90s two articles that were published by um, Samuel Huntington and by Zbigniew Brzezinski. The one is uh, what was later on the book, The Clash of Civilization, and the other one was an article that later on appeared as The Grand Chessboard. And so um, did the... Um, Council on Foreign Relations um, do essential think tank work when it comes to the wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq, respectively the war on terror that uh, followed then in, uh, after September 11. 
Yes, I have a whole chapter, in fact, uh, on the Iraq war because it's the most important foreign policy decision that the United States made in the 21st century. So I thought it was very important to give a case study. Now, each of these is a complicated you know, topic, uh, but I wanted to go into detail on the Iraq war because it was so important, and it definitely came out of the Council on Foreign Relations. The Council on Foreign Relations even had a book uh, called Threatening Storm, the case for invading Iraq, which came out in 2002 and reflected study group work and work by council fellows in an earlier period, which specified we, the United States should invade Iraq. Of course, that war came in 2003. 2002, the book came out, and this same guy that wrote the book, uh, Pollock, Kenneth Pollock, uh, he also wrote some articles for Foreign Affairs. And one of the articles was subtitled, It's the Oil, Stupid, that was the subtitle of one of his articles in Foreign Affairs where he's talking about the importance of oil in the Persian Gulf and why the Iraq War was important for that reason. Uh, now, of course, this is subdued because they, you know, they talk about it kind of indirectly because they don't want to be accused of, you know, imperialism and, you know, war for oil. But that's what it was all about. Even Alan Greenspan in his memoir said, and Alan Greenspan, of course, uh, the head of the Federal Reserve Board of the United States for so many years, was a director of the Council on Foreign Relations for many years. And, been and, a his, member and his wife, and his wife uh, who works in media, is also yeah. a council member. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Mitchell is her name. Yeah. Andrea Mitchell. Andrea Mitchell. Anyway, he, he wrote in his memoirs, it's, it's uh, sad to say that uh, nobody wants to admit that the Iraq war was all about oil. Yeah. Well, this is an insider who knew, you know, knows what's going on, and he was in the Federal Reserve Board head when this, this took place. So anyway, there's that uh, evidence, and then the council pursued that uh, in, in other venues, other ways, uh, that is, uh, through this, uh, another, another organization that uh, the Cheney was part of and Rumsfeld was part of, and all the decision makers, not all, I shouldn't say all, but most of the decision makers, Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice, Dick Cheney, Paul Wolfowitz, Donald Rumsfeld. Donald Rumsfeld case, he was a Council on Foreign Relations member early, but then he dropped out. So when he made the decision on the war, he wasn't a Council on Foreign Relations member. But the, these others were all Council on Foreign Relations members. And even the people they discussed the war with outside of the government, people like uh, Scowcroft and James Baker, uh, Kissinger, they discussed with them whether they should go to war, and they kind of came down, well, yes, I guess you're right, you know, maybe, I'm not, we're not sure, but anyway, uh, they also were Council on Foreign Relations people. So both the insiders who decided on the war, the background to the war of the council study groups that were, you know, interested in oil in the Middle East, uh, and the people who made the decision to go to war, they're all, all connected to the Council of Foreign Relations, and I document that very heavily. And it was a neoliberal geopolitical war. The geopolitical aspect, of course, is controlling oil because if, if Europe and Japan and China need the oil and you control the oil, both by having troops in Iraq and bases in Iraq, but also uh, being right adjacent to Saudi Arabia, where a lot of the oil comes from, if you control that, that gives you geopolitical leverage big time against these possible rivals. Uh, not so much Russia is another possible rival, or is a rival of the United States control of the world, but these other rivals are, their power is muted by the fact the United States controls the oil. That was the goal, at least. Uh, and then, of course, once they went into Iraq, Paul Bremer, who is a uh, Kissinger associate and another member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and John Negroponte and other people, uh, David Petraeus, these are all members of the Council on Foreign Relations. They became leaders of the Iraq War. And Bremer was the czar. He was in charge of everything before uh, later on uh, Negroponte became the ambassador once uh, Bremer left. And they turned uh, some control back over to the Iraqi people. But anyway, Bremer's program was neoliberal. It was uh, privatize the state-run economy, privatize the oil as much as you could. And the Iraq people resisted that, so they couldn't do it as much as they as easily as they wanted, but now ExxonMobil and Chevron and other big shell and other big multinationals, uh, often U.S. based, are in Iraq dealing with, you know, taking the oil. Uh, so it's been successful in that respect. 
It wasn't as easy as they thought it was going to be because the Iraq people resisted. It got complicated. But Bremer's program was those things plus free trade, plus setting up a stock market, uh, all kinds of neoliberal type. Of, they had this flat tax idea that has been you know vetted by these different capitalists who don't want to pay much tax. They put it was like a neoliberal experimental area that they decided. Okay, well put in neoliberalism here and everything will be fine. Well, of course, it wasn't fine, and the Iraq people began to resist, and the United States then had a very tough time extricating itself out of Iraq. But that's a case study of Council on Foreign Relations influence, and I have a whole chapter on it, uh, covering chapter and verse. And, of course, the tragedies, the human tragedies, the tortures, the uh, displacement of of millions of people, the killing of hundreds of thousands of people uh, is... It's just horrible, and it shows the uh, Council on Foreign Relations as one of the people who uh, gave me a little nice quote, uh, Joel Covell said, called it a beast. Council on Foreign Relations is a beast. And in many respects, it's a complicated organization, but in many respects, it is a beast. Because look at what they did to Iraq and the Iraq people. It's horrible. Yeah. Now, coming to um, nowadays, is the beast marching towards World War Three? with Russia and with China? There's that danger uh, because they just had a study group on China. I mentioned that as kind of a hypothetical, but actually they've had one. I'm sure they have more of them because it's such an important issue. The The world relationship in, in the future depends a lot on the U.S.-China relationship. There's other players, of course, but that relationship is so key. And, of course, China is interested as it becomes a more powerful country, and it is becoming more powerful daily, uh, it wants to control the areas around its borders, which is understandable. Uh, why wouldn't a country want to control the areas around its borders? Uh, and so that, but that comes into a clash in the South China and East China Seas. And the United States is, and the Council on Foreign Relations is adamant that they're going to be involved there and have their, their, their uh, ships and planes uh, involved there. And so there's a potential class, especially in the South China Sea, and the United States and, and the CFR is making mistakes, I believe. Like, for example, China wanted to set up a, uh, and in fact did, set up a multinational bank. They're an Asian development bank. And the United States decided, uh, you know, I'm not sure what the council's role was, but the council people in the government decided, uh, and maybe the council itself, I haven't studied that in any depth, but decided that they didn't want to participate. So then some U.S. allies like Britain fell out of that, uh, you know, U.S. ally position and joined the Asian Development Bank. That was a mistake on the part of the United States. It should have cooperated with China. So there's a – and this study group that the, that the council set up had Paul Wolfowitz on it and Scooter Libby and uh, other people from the Bush administration that wanted a hard line and the policy that came out. And you can get, again, on the CFR.org website, you can get that study group uh, – result and, and print it out and have a look at it. And also in Foreign Affairs, I'm not Foreign Affairs, in, in uh, Monthly Review magazine uh, earlier this, no, uh, I guess it was last year, September, I think, I uh, had an article on this study group. Anyway, they, the study group took a hard line towards China. Uh, and so there is a danger of World War III. I think uh, humanity faces two existential threats to its, ex to, to its future existence as a species. And that or those are nuclear war which is the danger of that is heightened by the conflict with Russia and Eastern Europe. Uh, and that's, again, the Council on Foreign Relations pushed making NATO push eastward and getting Poland and other countries in Eastern Europe into NATO. That was the Council on Foreign Relations program in the early 2000s. And you can see it in the Council on Foreign Relations annual report. And I did discuss it uh, briefly. Again, this is a giant topic. I wasn't able to discuss everything in this depth. In my cover that, of course, as we know, Russia is has as many nuclear weapons as the United States. Probably, I'm not sure what the exact ratio is, but they have plenty of nuclear weapons. The United States and Russia are the two largest holders of nuclear weapons. So that's a that's a flashpoint. Ukraine and Crimea and Eastern Europe and the United States pushing NATO eastward and board, uh, stationing troops on Russia's border. Russia, as we know, suffered immensely in World War II. 20 million dead at least, maybe more. A lot of their industry destroyed. They don't want to go through that experience again, so they're very sensitive about 
troops on their border, etc. So this is a dangerous flashpoint. And of course, China has nuclear weapons as well, and that's a flashpoint in the South China, East China Sea. If you got into a war, that could lead to a nuclear war there too as well. So that's an existential danger. The other one, of course, is climate change. And the world uh, leaders are not doing very much. They had a Paris Agreement, which is on paper. It hasn't really been implemented. And each year we see the, the raise in temperatures. Actually, Germany is doing a better job uh, than other countries in terms of getting uh, renewable energy. Uh, wind and solar and uh, other forms of renewable energy, Germany is the leader on that. Other countries should be taking the lead on that. Here in California, we're the, uh, the leader in the United States. On re it's way short of what it has to be. And I think, in fact, we have to overthrow the capitalist system, which is an expansive system. It says we have to expand infinitely. Well, we have a finite planet with a finite amount of water, earth, air, and resources. We can't have an infinitely expansive system on this finite planet. Eventually, it will doom us as a species, in my view. I think we need to have a vast discussion about whether capitalism is, is uh, compatible with life on Earth in the long run. And if it isn't, we need to change it sooner rather than later because it's getting hotter and hotter on our planet, and we don't want to end up like Venus where you can melt lead on Venus. Uh, so we don't want to end, the, end up that way and have humanity uh, go the way of the dinosaurs. So we, uh, who are thinking people, educated people, need to be fighting and talking about uh, and try to raise people's consciousness about the changes we need to make in order to make life viable on the long run. We owe it to our, ourselves, we owe it to our children, we owe it to our grandchildren. And there not, not, may not be any great-grandchildren if we don't deal with this. Yeah. Now, um, talking in geo geopolitical terms, is the closer alliance that we experience between Russia and China something like a nightmare to people at Chatham House and CFR? And how do they cope with the fact that they themselves push uh, Russia and China closer together? <laughs> well, that's a, a very <laughs> difficult question. I don't really know. I haven't seen anything from the CFR on that particular issue. There may be something, uh, but I haven't. Uh, again, I've uh, mentioned that it's a big topic, uh, the, the CFR in general. And I haven't seen anything specifically on that. It seems that they're so far they're not very worried. The Russian China do, does have that Shanghai group or Shanghai Accord that they have some informal relationships, but it's not a formal military alliance or anything. And they're working together, but I'm not sure they're totally in accord, Russia and China. And so maybe the CFR is not worried. You know, China has its uh, one, one belt, one road idea of uh, moving along the old Silk Road with their economic power into Europe. Yeah. So that may contradict some of Russia's plans or, or, or ambitions. Uh, yeah, so, but but Russia and China, they are finding ways to cooperate in this yeah. uh, endeavor. Yeah. Certainly, certainly the United States is pushing by its policies, mistaken policies, I believe, two aggressive policies is pushing them together. Now, so I don't have a good answer to your very excellent question, uh, but maybe that's something I should be working on in the yeah. future. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but we know a little bit the thinking of people like Brzezinski, who is a guru, Yeah. And, and I think for him, it must be something like the ultimate nightmare. Yeah, there, that's true, because Brzezinski in his, uh, that uh, book you mentioned uh, and other books that he's written, the Grand Chessboard uh, book, he talks about that. And it, it's almost like the Mackinder mantra of whoever controls the world island controls the world. Yeah. You know, and that. That's the world island. Is Russia and, and China together is the world island. But but Brzezinski solves it by building up counterforce in Western Europe and and East Asia, Japan and other other allies on, on the east side and and Germany and other allies on the west side, including Britain and France and Italy. Uh, so that's how Brzezinski counters the possibility of this uh, nightmare taking place where the world island is controlled by a hostile power 
Also, they're trying to control the southern zone. That the Iraq War and its geopolitics was about that, the southern part of the world island that is the Middle East yeah. and Southwest yeah. Asia. So they have an alliance system to control that. And, you know, they these these other powers are uh, being more aggressive than uh, in the past. Uh, China particularly has not been that aggressive in the past. It's getting more aggressive. So they definitely have uh, their work cut out for them if they want to keep controlling the world with China being such a powerful player, particularly China, but also Russia, because Putin is a very clever geopolitician in my view. Yeah. Um, now, coming to my last two questions, the first would be, is the CFR of importance with respect to this year's presidential race? Uh, yes, because Hillary Clinton is so, as I mentioned uh, before, is so close to the Council on Foreign Relations uh, that the Council on Foreign Relations has a big influence over her uh, and her policies. Uh, and she's, of course, representing not just the Council, in my view, but also the transnational capitalist class. She's uh, broader there. Now, Trump, of course, is not connected to the Council on Foreign Relations. He's never been a member. His advisors... Uh, all his advisors I've looked at, only one of them is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and he's not a very important, I forget which one it was, but one of his foreign policy advisors is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. So there is a connection, but I wouldn't emphasize it very much because Trump's policies he's advocating against NATO, against the trade agreements, uh, these policies are more oriented towards uh, working class needs and interests in the United States. He's trying to appeal to the Tea Party group and more nationalist oriented white nationalism, you could call it. Uh, it's almost like a fascist program in many respects because it's racist towards immigrants, it's uh, white nationalist, it's uh, uh, against these uh, multinational, international things. Trump wants to be uh, some kind of dictator. Uh, trust me, everything will be fine, just elect me. He doesn't give any policy specifics. It's a whole lot of aspects to Trump that are neo-fascist or fascist and is not connected to the Council on Foreign Relations and not the Council on Foreign Relations program. Yeah, uh, of course, this other is, Lawrence, this is true, but yeah. there, there was one um, article in the New York Times that I saw in March of this year, and our uh, listeners can find it under the headline, Donald Trump held briefing with Richard Haas, head of Council on Foreign Relations. This was... Uh, Mr. Haas invited all presidential candidates of the two main political parties to visit the Council on Foreign Relations, and Mr. Trump was one of those people who did this, actually. So yeah, it, it, it's typical. not that special. Yeah, no, that's typical of the Council on Foreign Relations. They're going to invite all the candidates and have some connection with them if they can. But Trump hasn't listened to, in my view, to what Richard Haas's program is. Mm -hmm. Trump is not a follower of neoliberal geopolitics, yeah. in my view. He's a follower of uh, Trump, uh, you know, a, a, a real estate guy that has a lot of nationalist connections. So he's the national uh, section, a sector of the national capitalist class. And of course, the, the another thing that I should mention is the 50, uh, you may have seen this, 50... Uh, former national security officials, yeah. all yeah. Republicans, who served in the Republican administrations from Nixon up to George W. Bush, 50 of them signed a letter that they would not vote for Trump, that Trump would, quote, be the most reckless president in American history, totally against Trump. And if you look at those 50, 29 of them, are, I looked at them, 29 of them are members of the Council on Foreign Relations. That's 58 percent. That's a very high percentage. Yeah. And it includes... The co-chair of the Council on Foreign Relations, Carla A. Hills, she signed it too. She's the co-chair with Robert Rubin, who's a Democrat, uh, so he wouldn't be signing this Republican one. Uh, so uh, other other people are Robert Blackwell, who's a uh, fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, Robert Zolik, who's a former uh, director of the Council on Foreign Relations. So a whole bunch of people, uh, Council on Foreign Relations people, signed this letter that they're not voting for Trump. So I would say the Council on Foreign Relations, overall, there may be a few people that support Trump. As against Trump, they want Clinton to be elected, and they're going to try to make sure Clinton does get elected with their funds. Of course, Council on Foreign Relations is a capitalist class organization of the old plutocracy. All the big names you could name, Rockefeller, DuPont, 
Mellon, you know, Vanderbilt, all these big plutocratic names in American history, their descendants, many of them are members of the Council on Foreign Relations, and recent rich people like Bloomberg and others like that are members of the Council on Foreign Relations. A lot of billionaires, they have a lot of money to give to candidates, and they're giving to Clinton. And they have a lot of media to cover for Clinton. So Clinton, in my view, looks like Clinton's going to sweep this election. But, of course, the, the Clinton has laid the table and the Council on Foreign Relations and the Obama administration and the Bush administration has not served the American people well. And there's been static uh, wages. The uh, wages for the American average American worker have stayed static for about 25 or 30 years. So there's a lot of dissatisfaction that Trump is appealing to. And so that's their mistake. They're being too greedy and too much for the rich and not enough for the rank and file. So Trump is getting some traction that way uh, with the, and being against trade agreements, which he's saying, and which to some extent that's true, of course, that the jobs are being exported. Yes, jobs are being exported. And the American worker is the one that's suffering. So that some of them are going to vote for Trump. So they've set the table for Trump, these uh, international capitalists like Clinton, uh, have set the table for Trump, and Trump is trying to capitalize on it. Now, it's, it's an open question whether or not the, the election, how the election will go. It looks to me like it'll be uh, Clinton. I should also mention the Green Party is, uh, I'm a member of the Green Party. I think we have to have another party that's not a capitalist party, and the Democrats and Republicans are both capitalist parties, in my view. So I'm for Jill Stein. For uh, She's not in the CFR, and she doesn't have any CFR advisors. Yeah. Jill Stein is the Green Party candidate for president. Yeah, and do you think that uh, people of 300 million people can re can be represented by two parties or three parties? <laughs> no, I think we, we need a totally different system. The Green Party has advocated for uh, proportional representation like you have in Germany and ranked choice voting so we can vote for, for executive offices, so we can rank our choices. We can say we want Jill Stein first, but... In, in order not to have Trump get elected, we'll put down Hillary Clinton second. A lot of people would like to do that. Mm -hmm. So their vote for Jill Stein can count. Of course, we don't have that electoral system. The Democrats and the Republicans want to monopolize. Uh, the Democrats want to blackmail us into voting for Clinton because Trump is so bad. That's their mantra. That's the way they work. Oh, we, we know you don't like Clinton, but look at Trump. Whoa, is he bad? You better vote for Clinton. Well, a lot of us don't want to be blackmailed like that. We think we should be able to vote for Jill Stein. And if we do want to stop Trump, we could be vote for Clinton second. But that in involves a different electoral system. We need a different electoral system. We have an 18th century electoral system and 21st century. It's backward. And the Green Party has been advocating and talking about having a different electoral system, which is more democratic. Without pro proportional representation, and they gerrymander the districts. So if you're a Republican or a Green in a Democratic district, you have no representation because you can't win. They gerrymandered it so it's 60% Democrat. So if you get 49.9% of the vote, you get zero representation. Is that Democratic? No, it's not. So we try to fight for the uh, a fair Democrat, uh, you know, electoral system, a Democratic electoral system that's really expresses democracy, but we haven't succeeded. The Democrats don't, even in California here, the Democrats control everything in California. The governor, the state legislature, the assembly, uh, they can put in instant runoff voting or ranked choice voting, they could put in proportional representation, but of course they don't want to because that would undermine their power. So it takes a tremendous people's effort to try to get these different electoral systems. But that's what we need in the United States. We have a backward electoral system run by big money also. The, uh, we had this uh, Supreme Court decision that allowed unlimited funds for the billionaires to run the electoral system. So we have a, a very... A fake democracy. It's not a real democracy. And a lot of us have been fighting for real democracy, but we haven't succeeded yet, and we hope that uh, we'll be able to in the future. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, is the CFR a prime reason why the foreign policy of the U.S. rarely changes no matter who's in the White House? This would be my yes. final question. Yes, that's, that's right. The capitalist class influence on government policies is pervasive, And the Council on Foreign Relations organizes the power of this capitalist class and therefore magnifies its power even more than it would be otherwise because they organize it in their study groups, in their, in their propaganda, through their foreign affairs magazine, through their media outlets, through their publications. 
their books and, and public, actually articles in other publications, other magazines as well. So they control people's minds largely. And then when the new government comes in, because they're advising the presidents, and many times the presidents are even members like Bill Clinton or Jimmy Carter or George H.W. Bush, they're members of the council. They just put in a call to the council membership off their list to get a lot of their staff members. So we have 500 or so council members that are been, been involved in government. So the future is open, but uh, the past has been uh, that a large, very large percentage. In fact, one of my chapters, I go into the Council on Foreign Relations and how many of Council on Foreign Relations people have been in top leadership in the government since 1976. And I covered all the top leadership positions in the U.S. government and compared to the Council on Foreign Relations membership list. And I found that 80 percent of the top government officials of the United States government from 1976 to 2014 were members of this one organization. No other organization comes close to that kind of power, that this one organization has 80 percent of the top leadership of the U.S. government. Okay. okay. Thank you very much for this conversation. Thank you, Lars. I appreciate it very much. You have and a good day. Yeah, thank you. And I hope our listeners will get a copy of your book. I uh, repeat again, it's called Wall Street Think Tank, The Council on Foreign Relations and the Empire of Neoliberal Geopolitics, 1976 to 2014. And uh, one last question. What is your website? Uh, Lawrence Shoup, L-A-U-R, E-N-C-E-S-H-O-U-P, one word, L-A-U-R-E-N-C-E-S-H-O-U-P dot org. Okay, visit this website. Thank you very much. Thank Good you. Good night.